gets out of bed and he answers the door and it's Payne Stewart and Payne's got a big smile on his face and he says, what are you doing? And he says, nah, dude, I'm already in bed. I've, I've got nothing left. Payne says, yeah, none of us do. So what? Get back downstairs. He says, uh, no, nah, Payne, it's all right. You guys go ahead. And Payne Stewart says, well, I'm not leaving without you. Just get dressed. Tiger looks at Payne. He says, Payne, what's the big deal? Payne Stewart says, Tiger, the big deal is you never know if you're ever going to get to do this again. So you make it last as long as you can. Tiger says, Payne, we're going to win this thing over two years. Payne looks at him and says, you don't know that. Get dressed and get downstairs. This is On the Tee with h and I'm DJ Jones, and that was the voice of Chandler Withington, PGA head professional at Hazeltine National Golf Club. Chandler was kind enough to take the time out of his busy summer season at Hazeltine to come and talk golf, life, and of course, the Ryder Cup. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy part one of our conversation with Chandler Withington. Well, Chandler, welcome to On the Tee with h and I can only imagine how insanely busy it must be at Hazeltine right now. So we appreciate you investing uh, some of your valuable time with us here today. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, you know, you guys are our friends. Uh, you guys have made a lot of memories for us. And the least I can do is give you some time. Uh, even though we're busy, I'm always ready to talk off with you guys. So ready to go. Well, that's all great stuff. And you're exactly right. Uh, you've been a great friend to H&B for many years now. But let's start this further back than that. Uh, Everyone in the game of golf has an origin story. We'd love to hear a little of yours. Yeah, we all do have an origin story, don't we? And I enjoy hearing others uh, when I get to know them. And that's that's a pretty common question to ask people is, how'd you get into golf? And um, I probably don't have the traditional story. Uh, No one in my family played, uh, my parents or any of my friends, uh, growing up as a kid in the late 80s and early 90s, um, I would go as far as to say golf wasn't the most popular choice uh, for kids, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, we're still kind of five to 10 years away from Tiger showing up and, and really grabbing everyone's attention. So in, in my mind, golf growing up was like the game you played if, if you couldn't run, jump, throw, you know, it was the game that was played by uh, kind of older men uh, as, as they became what I consider to be non-athletes. So uh, we were down in uh, on a spring break in Harbortown, uh, South Carolina in the spring of 92. All of my uh, uncles and cousins from Atlanta were the big golfers, and we were actually staying on a house uh, on Harbortown the week of the PGA Tour. So uh, in the backyard, we're staying right off this house off the second green. The tour was going on, and all my cousins were trying to get me to go watch golf with them, and I, I kind of I had no interest. I played baseball and hockey as a kid. Uh, but eventually there's nothing else really to do. So I went out and watched golf. And I think we went out behind the 50 at Harbor Towns, a par five and watched the guys hit driver. And I think for anybody who's listening, if, if you can recall the first time you saw live professional golf, it, it makes an impact. And I think especially in that time, because it's the sights and sounds, it's so different. You know, people are quiet when the players walk by as opposed to going to a hockey game or a football or baseball game. And uh, you get these caddies with these big bags and the sounds of spikes walking on a cart path or uh, even the sound of persimmon wood. So uh, those were some of the sounds that I remember from that first time in a, watching the guys hit driver, it got my attention. And then a younger player came around and hit a persimmon wood out of sight. And that really got my attention. And uh, he was younger. So I mean, younger back then was late twenties. It wasn't the 19, 20 year olds that we see now. So I said, let's go watch him some more. So he went on to win that weekend. We watched it all the way through the end. And uh, he immediately became my favorite player and, and who I wanted to emulate and try to be like. Um, and I came home and started uh, wanting to learn how to play golf. And my education as a kid was uh, whenever that player would play in a PGA tournament, if he was in contention, I'd, if anybody can remember the, the letters VCR, I would turn my VCR on and I would record and rewatch it and rewind it and do it again, then go in the backyard and just try to imitate what I was seeing. Uh, so that was my start. And um Fast forward, I think uh, about 12 years, I've, I've watched him play a lot of golf, watched him play in tournaments, I watched him win a major uh, in New York. And I'm sure a lot of people can figure out who this player is by now. But um, when I was at Seminole, uh, Bob Ford knew that I had never met my favorite player. And they have the great pro-am the day after the, the Honda or whatever they want to, the tournament they call it now. But he knew I'd never met him and he made sure I got the caddy for him. I think there was this um, kind of almost nervous fear uh, that I'm going to finally meet this guy and I'm I'm hoping he's going to live up to the expectation that I had for him. Cause if, you know, if he's not nice to me, I'm going to have to find a new player. And 
there was really no one else that I wanted to root for. But uh, my favorite player was Davis Love. He could not have been kinder or nicer to me and more encouraging to me. His dad was a PGA professional. And uh, that was a magical day for me. And it got to caddy for him again the next year and start a relationship. But watching Davis play at Harbortown was really what got me started. And uh, really the pastor of my church was the guy who made me my first set of clubs and got me down to golf camps in Pinehurst. And that was the start of the journey. Well, you know the old saying, don't meet your heroes, but I'm not at all surprised to learn that Davis Love lived up to the hype, and what a way to not only find the game of golf, but eventually the golf business. Uh, You mentioned your time with Bob Ford. He's pretty much a legend in the business, and I'm curious, how did that opportunity come about, and what did you learn from him that maybe still applies to your career today? Yeah, I think similar to the question you just asked, I ask a lot of people, um, how did you get to where you are now? And I think the commonality I've found with a lot of people is uh, there's a lot of luck and timing involved with that. Um, and uh, it's no different for me. And when I've, I started at Campbell University, I had to get internships for the summer. And uh, I had come home to New Jersey where I grew up and uh, Canoebrook Country Club in New Jersey was a club that um, I played in high school. I had two great golf courses and I just applied for an internship there because I just figured if when I get off the clock, I have a choice of playing two great golf courses. And the head professional there at the time was Greg Lecker. And I interviewed for the job and not knowing that Greg Lecker had been a former assistant at Oakmont for Bob Ford and not really knowing how the network of the golf industry worked. And I just kind of got lucky. I uh, got an opportunity to work for Greg, which was, I think Greg's probably the most impactful person that I've worked for in the golf industry. Uh, he really shaped and molded me in those early days. And uh, after I actually got laid off from my first job out of college in North Carolina, uh, Greg gave me an opportunity to come back to New Jersey. It was at a time in my life where I was ready to work hard and, um, and put everything I had into the industry. And Greg really believed in me, uh, made a phone call to Bob Ford and recommended that I work for him at Seminole for the winners. And it was, uh, it was quite a turning point in my career to go from being laid off to working for who's arguably the top golf professional in the industry at the time. Uh, and working at one of the, the most prominent golf clubs uh, in our country. So that was a, an opportunity, uh, good timing. It didn't hurt that Bob Ford had a, a son named Chandler, I bet. Um, and I had the opportunity. And I think uh, for those of people who are familiar with Bob Ford or his reputation, I think the first thing we think of is what a great player he was and how many different championships he played in, uh, player of the year awards he's won uh, to, to not a, only have held mm-hmm not just one, uh, but two of the most prominent jobs in our industry between Oakmont and winners at Seminole and play at a high, uh, high ability for so long uh, is admirable. So Bob was first always encouraging us to keep our golf game sharp. I think he always tried to remind us that um, any golf professional can pull the shirt, but not everyone can shoot 69. And he really felt that playing was a way to separate yourself from your competition. And I, I strongly agree. And I still take pride in my game I've still taken lessons and I still try to improve, but I still feel like my Bob was ahead of me. I think a lot of that just stems from being in that network. Um, I think Bob was also great at uh, making other people feel important as important as he was. I think his saying was always, it's, it's nice to import. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And Bob uh, is very generous, uh, humble, but he was quick to acknowledge others. uh, Didn't really want to talk about himself. He always wanted to talk about others. And then the other thing I just noticed in a couple of years I was around him was that uh, when he had to make a decision on something, uh, he really just tried to gather all the information. He didn't rush to uh, an opinion or a decision. He, he was re- rather thorough. And, and I think we're in a society today where we, we tend to make judgments very, rather quickly. And, and I think Bob took his time. And when he landed on something, he was pretty confident in it. So that was a, a wonderful two years, uh, an education that you really can't pay for and uh, more than lucky to have uh, gotten to spend some time around Bob. Well, you touched on the luck of the break, and you've obviously made the most of that break. Um, how did you come to find yourself at Hazeltine? Well, you, I try to remind a lot of people, you, you never really know where the help is going to come from. And now that I'm 43 and, and more than 20 years into this industry, I turn around and tell a lot of young people that are with us, I think, Um, don't think about interviewing for a job as the interview that's years from now. I mean, you're already interviewing and you never really know who's going to step in and help you. So the person sitting next to you in your class, if you're in college or um, the coworker that you have in your first job, um, the member at the club or the guest that you interacted with, all those people might have a say in your future. 
Um, so I would actually, be, before I talk about getting to Hazeltine, I would talk about um, my time at Seminole. Uh, the first winter I was down in uh, an opening happened uh, on his team at Oakmont and I knew he was looking for somebody to fill in pretty quick. And I grabbed him one night and I said, look, I'd be an idiot not to express interest in this. You know, would you consider me for it? And he said, I'll consider you, but you have to get uh, Greg Lecker, who was who I was working for in New Jersey to, to let you go. And I knew that was going to be a challenge because I only come back and worked one summer for him. And he kind of told us all, you know, kind of like Mike Krzyzewski at Duke, you know, no one and dones. You got to work a few years here to earn the opportunity to move up. Uh, so he sent a younger professional to me, uh, a guy named Chris Muldoon, uh, who's more than worthy of the of the opportunity. Chris got to go, and I got to move up the chain at, at Canoebrook to the lead assistant, which was an opportunity for me. Go back to Seminole for a second winter, and now uh, an opportunity opened up to kind of move up the ladder at Seminole. And I I thought I was next in line for it, and I kind of got thrown a curveball by Bob. He said, "Yeah, I know." Uh, you're looking for this opportunity here, but I think you've kind of moved past it. It's a better fit for this other person. I'm going to give it to him. And I think you ought to start interviewing to become a head professional. So kind of twice I got passed over there and was kind of scratching my head. And, uh, but I had to figure out the next opportunity. So if you're still following this story with me, Chris Muldoon, who went to Oakmont, his twin brother, Kevin Muldoon, was leaving Marion Golf Club that same winter to become the, uh, the lead assistant at Shinnecock Hills. And the top two assistants at Marion had left. And Kevin called me and said, I think there's a great opportunity to be lead assistant at Marion here, which would be interested. And, you know, of course I was, I was interviewing for head jobs, but Marion was in a very unique spot. They'd just been awarded their first US Open since 1981 to happen in 2013. And uh, I walked down to Ardmore and had a great interview and that's where I ended up going. And uh, the handshake agreement uh, that I had with the head professional Scott and I at the time was uh, that I would spend three years at Marion. The 2009 Walker Cup was on the horizon. He needed me to stay three years and knowing that there were going to be opportunities to, to pursue other head jobs or even greater opportunities than Marion were going to come up that I could be loyal and stay three years. So the, the turning point came pretty quick where um, after my first year, Greg, Leffer, Greg Lecker uh, left Canoebrook after I think close to or over 20 years. And uh, Canoebrook called me and said, would you come interview for this job? And you know, you're, you're tasked with, you made a handshake deal and are you as good as your word or are you kind of looking out what's best for you? And it was really hard timing. I would have loved to have interviewed for the job at Canoebrook. That was a great time of my life, but I felt like being loyal was the right play and ended up staying three years, ended up meeting my wife, Maureen, shortly thereafter. And um, we got through 2009. And, and then I think my mindset was, I think I was roughly 30 at the time. And um, I felt like I've, I was ready to go. I was ready to lead a club. And I started interviewing for jobs and started finishing second place a lot. And it, you know, it took a couple of years to, to figure out the combination for these interviews. They're really competitive. Only uh, one guy can win. One guy or girl can win for these head jobs. They're fantastic opportunities. And uh, I had to learn how to really compete and tell my story and connect with clubs and figure out how I could help them. So um, in the fall of 2012, uh, the second part of this, you never know who's going to help you. So we heard about Chris Muldoon helping me uh, get to Marion through his brother, Kevin. Uh, the other guy who got the promotion at Seminole was a uh, a uh, guy named Nathan Olhoff. And uh, if anybody's listening to this podcast and knows Nathan, they know that he's now the head professional at Interlock and about you know, 25 minutes away from me here in Minnesota. And Nathan was really the guy who sent me the job posting for Hazeltine, even though he had other friends in the mix. Uh, he didn't hesitate to help me and uh, changed our lives. You know, I might've heard about the job through somebody else, but I heard about it through Nathan. And um, by then I'd, I'd figured out how to really learn what a club was looking for. Um, how I could help them and how to line up uh, those two things, you know, how coming to Hazeltine was going to be a great fit for my family and then how I could help. And uh, the putt fell and I, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm now in my ninth year. Uh, lots happened here and uh, Hazeltine's a club that's 60 years old now and we're, we're still finding our way and still looking to improve. And it's really energizing for me to get up here every morning and every day and, and try to find our 1% way of getting better and uh, helping us continue to grow. Well, you mentioned Hazeltine and the heritage of the club. Obviously, it's a major championship venue, but I think when when most golfers think of Hazeltine, the 2016 Ryder Cup immediately comes to mind. Let's go down memory lane. I mean, what was that weekend like in your shoes? And, you know, what memories or stories maybe came out of it for you? Well, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic memory um, because of the outcome. You know, it's, you probably wouldn't be asking me about it if 
if we had lost a big lead or, or we didn't win it, we'd probably still talk about it, but it wouldn't be as fun to talk about. And I'm, I hate it for, uh, for those uh, people who posted and it didn't come their way at, at home. We got lucky. And, um, because of that it's, it's fun to talk about. So I think kind of what I alluded to earlier in, in the pod was, uh, I grew up a Davis fan gotten to meet him. I was actually interviewing for the job here in 2012 while his team was playing in Chicago. And then I got through the first interview and then his team had the really tough loss at Medina that Sunday. And I, I watched it not knowing I was going to end up here. And then I get the job here maybe three weeks later. And um, to get to the top of the mountain was a thrill for a job like this. Incredible. And now a Ryder Cup's going to happen four years from now. But there was this like slight twinge of, of disappointment that he had just captain because if there's anybody who I would have wanted to be our captain it, it would have been him but I'm also a, a golf historian I knew the history of the Ryder Cup no losing captains ever gotten to do it twice you know we've had a couple winning captains Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson do it twice they won no losing captains ever gotten a second crack at it. so tough you know I'm, I'm looking forward to see who we're going to have to work with but I wish it had been Davis and uh, Team USA went to Scotland in 2014 and had a really tough time and People who are familiar with the history of the Ryder Cup remember some of the turmoil after that one and they form a task force and they're looking for how to put it back on the tracks and from that uh, they gave Davis Love a second chance to be our captain. I remember sitting in this office in February of 2015 um, wondering who it's going to be and I got a text from someone uh, who had heard an early report that they're going to name Davis Love as the captain. It was you know late. I was the only one in here. I remember it was snowing outside. I mean I sat there and looked at that text for 15 minutes. Uh, same kind of mix of of excitement and fear that I felt that night before I was going to meet him for the first time of love that he's going to get a second chance at this, but man, we better make this one count. And uh, if there's anything that I can do to win or to help the team win, I'm going to do it. So I, as prepared as I was for the interview process at Hazeltine, I was probably uber and more focused on uh, the USA team coming in here. And uh, I'm a data and analytics guy. So I, I spent a lot of time watching past Ryder Cups, looking for every edge that we could find, uh, particularly is how it comes to setting up the golf course. And uh, thankfully, and I give Davis a lot of credit, I think, you know, through a disappointing loss at uh, Chicago, he was open-minded about uh, different ways of doing things. And I kind of presented uh, some data and some analytics to him when he first got here and he was open-minded to it. And uh, we had a data team called Scouts Inc. that started working with him and his team also to help them get prepared. And uh, we felt really good about the team that was coming in here. But um, a couple stories that I would share that I think are interesting for the people that are listening. If we have to think back to the 2016 Ryder Cup, I think one thing that we we tend to forget happened that week was that on Sunday night before the week even started, I, uh, my memory was I was out on the golf course with my wife and we had two daughters at the time. We now have three. We were riding around kind of taking some family photos and getting ready for the week. And I had to get up to our ballroom. Uh, there was a kickoff event to the week. All of our chairpersons and members were up there. Uh, PJ Brass and Pete Pavacqua and Derek Sprague were in there. And I was trying to get to that event. And uh, my wife drove me up just outside the golf shop and Davis Love was sitting outside the golf shop on the phone. And I knew he was calling the players that did make the team. And those are the hardest calls to make. And I got out of the car and he just got off a call. I said, how many more you got? He said, I got two more. I'm going to make this announcement. You know, he had one final pick. He was going to pick Ryan Moore, who just gotten in a fantastic playoff with Rory at Eastlake. And uh, I want to go inside and kind of watch the announcement with the rest of the members. And um, we went inside and they got Davis in front of this uh, Ryder Cup backdrop. You know, they're going to go on NBC during halftime of the Sunday night football game and he's going to announce the pick. So he's getting all wired up and I went into the ballroom to watch uh, it all play out. And as soon as I walked in, a member put his phone right in front of my face. And it was a tweet that said, golfing legend Arnold Palmer has just passed away at the age of 87. Kind of freezes you in your tracks. We, we, we think we're prepared for everything that's going to happen, but you can't prepare for uh, a living legend to pass away at a time like that. And uh, things started moving pretty quick. Uh, Julius Mason and some of the people from the PGA team that handle communications were working with me to kind of get the flag out, out front to have staff. And I kind of had to make them pause for a little bit. You, you can't just, I knew a lot about flag code from the Walker Cup. We had a logo that was controversial because some flags were higher than others. And I'd read this 50 page document on, on flag code. And I knew you can't just, you know, say, hey, we're going to miss our, our friend, Daniel Jones. Let's put the flag down to half staff. There's a, a code of conduct to it. Uh, we made some phone calls that night and got a proclamation from our governor, Dayton, 
that we could have it up at half staff for the entire week for the Ryder Cup. And uh, Rich Lerner and the live from the Ryder Cup team came in and had a, about a five or a six hour show. I think we left the set about 2 a.m. that night. I sat on the other side of the camera and uh, Rich Lerner and everyone from Golf Channel, I mean, Rich Lerner deserves an award for that show. It was fantastic how prepared he was. He had this big purple binder that said Pennzoil on the side of it. You know, Arnold Palmer had started the Golf Channel and this was basically like their 9-11 was to cover his life and honor honor their, their founder and creator. Um, and they did a wonderful job of that. And there were so many players uh, that called in to talk about their memories of Arnold. And I think what struck me was that, you know, no one really talked about the accomplishments, the Masters, the shot at Cherry Hills, the US Open, um, Ryder Cups, you name it. You know, we all talked about who Arnold was as a person. And I think as you head into a week like the Ryder Cup, when we think, you know, somebody's legacy is going to be defined uh, by how they perform in a Ryder Cup, um, we, we, we come to find that at the end of the road, that's not really the case. We remember the kind of person you were. So a uh, great tone for that to start the week. Um, I think a moment I'll always remember was, you know, we, we won the Ryder, say we, Team USA won the Ryder Cup on Sunday afternoon. And um, it's funny, I brought up uh, Kevin Muldoon, who'd had such an impact on my career by getting me that opportunity at Marion. I invited him to come up and kind of work with me that week. I mean, more or less, I hate to say it worked for me, um, but he did such a wonderful job. He did two really impactful things that week. The second one was he had gotten and found my family and gotten them inside the ropes that when we came over this huge bridge where we got to celebrate with the fans, uh, right before I went over the bridge, you know, Davis Love came over and gave me a hug and he started to realize that all this work that we kind of put in for it for a couple of years, it paid off and uh, got him a great memory out of it and uh, go over the bridge, you celebrate with all these fans and then you, you come down the bridge and uh, my wife and daughters are waiting there. And I think the gravity of that moment was um, how, sacrificial it had been for my wife uh, and my kids over those, you know, really the four years, the first four years we've been here, it's, you jump into this job and it was, you know, zero to hundred miles an hour real quick. And um, she really held it all together at home. And, and she's as much a hero of this story as anyone. And to come down that bridge and see them in that moment, give them a hug and realize that things had gone the way that we had hoped that what were was, was really fantastic. Um, one last story I'll share. And, and I've told, this story in a number of different outlets. So it might be repetitive to some people, but I think it was, um, it really captured a moment of where uh, one person was with his life and how uh, kind of introspective he was being. Um, Tiger Woods was an assistant captain in 2016. He was, in my opinion, fantastic as far as helping the team prepare, uh, have confidence um, and really just kind of being a support for the entire team. And on Sunday night after Team USA had won, we had, the team had done the, uh, the closing ceremonies, the uh, closing press conference, and they're back in the locker room, kind of cleaning out their lockers and getting ready to head back to the hotel, which is where the real party was. And Tiger said, hey, guys, I, I want to talk to everyone just for a second. And the guys gather around, and he said, hey, tonight when we get back to the hotel, let's really stay up late and enjoy this one. And the guys started laughing because they're, they're like, you don't really need to tell us that. We, we know that. We're going to have fun. And he said, the reason I tell you guys that is that in 1999, when we had the comeback win at Brookline, it was only Tiger's second Ryder Cup. He said, you know, we head back to the hotel, we have, we have dinner, we have drinks, you know, party a little bit, but by like 1030, I just, I had nothing left and this week just kind of takes it out of you. So I kind of snuck out of the room and went back and got my hotel room and said about an hour later, somebody's pounding on the door and um, it's players only every every week of the Ryder Cup, so he knows it's one of the players. And you know, for ten minutes, whoever it is is not going away. So finally, he gets out of bed and he answers the door, and it's Payne Stewart. And Payne's got a big smile on his face, and he says, "What are you doing?" And he says, nah, "Dude, I'm already in bed. I've I've got nothing left." Payne says, "Yeah, none of us do. So what? Get back downstairs." He says, uh, "Not Payne. It's all right. You guys go ahead." And Payne Stewart says, "Well, I'm not leaving without you. So get dressed." Tiger looks at Payne. He says. Payne, what's the big deal? Payne Stewart says, Tiger, the big deal is you never know if you're ever going to get to do this again. So you make it last as long as you can. Tiger says, Payne, we're going to win this thing over two years. Payne looks at him and says, you don't know that. Get dressed and get downstairs. And Tiger said, I'm so thankful he came back and got me that night. And, you know, I'll always remember that night. And uh, Payne wasn't wrong. You know, he, uh, that was the only winning team that Tiger played on. And we lost Payne Stewart three weeks later. So the message to the team was, you know, enjoy this moment because uh, you never know when it's going to come around again. And, you know, sure enough, you know, 
USA team lost two years later and, and they'd be lucky to win this fall. It's a very good European team. We don't, we don't get to beat these guys very often anymore. So enjoy the moment was uh, the message that I took away on that closing Sunday night. Man, that is some story. Uh, I had not heard that story. Uh, absolute goosebumps on this side of the screen. I mean, hearing about my hero as a kid, Tiger Woods, and and then, of course, another hero in Arnold Palmer. Uh, but talk about everything coming full circle for you. I mean, you're, you meet your golfing hero as a kid, and then you fast forward to 2016, and, and there he is with you, and you're a part of this incredible moment. I'm just not sure how you can draw it up any better than that. I know it's uh, the term you just uh, used uh, coming full circle. Um, The following year, uh, Davis Love got inducted to the World Golf Hall of Fame. And my wife and I were fortunate enough to be invited to his his ceremony in New York City. And um, Davis closed his speech and talking about that. He said, in golf, I think his father had told him, you know, things come around in in circles. And uh, up on the podium, he had his crystal from when his dad was the low round of the 64 masters. And he said, my dad was the low round of the 64 masters. He didn't win, but Arnold Palmer did. And for Arnold to have left us right before the week of the Ryder cup was a full circle. And, um, in 95, Davis love was the low round of the uh, first round of the masters. And he had his crystal and he said, I didn't win, but my good friend Ben Crenshaw did. And we both took lessons from Harvey Pinnock who had passed away that, that week. So we see these things come around again. And, um, I'm going to just uh, segue and share, and share one other story with you, if you can stand it. Um, the, the 2016 Ryder Cup was such a collision of things that have happened so far in my life. Uh, one other segue to that was uh, I'd share with you about Harbortown in 92. Well, I, I came home to New Jersey, and the next summer, uh, the U.S. Open is going to be played at Balthasrol. And the pastor of my church, again, the guy who made me my first set of clubs and really got me going in the game, um, took me to a breakfast on Monday morning of U.S. Open week. He said, you know, every table is going to have a, a tour professional and you're going to get to meet a tour player and uh, it's a fundraiser, et cetera. And I was so excited. I was like, who am I going to meet? You know, would I meet Davis? You know, would I meet uh, Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer? Who am I going to meet? And uh, so excited in this event gets going and, you know, full ball, ballroom full of three to 500 people and every table is filling up and our table up and we didn't get a pro at our table. And, uh, kind of looking around. I'm like, what, what happened here? You know, thought we were supposed to have a pro. And I turned to the guy next to me who's kind of older, maybe going a little bald at the time. And I said, I'm a 14 year old kid. And you know, I looked at him and I said, what happened? I thought we were supposed to have a pro at our table. And he had been talking this way and I've been talking that way. And he turns to me and he looks me in the eye and he says, I'm sorry to introduce myself. My name's Tom Lehman. I am the pro. You know, in 93, you know, he had to have seen the disappointment on my face. I'm like, I've never heard of you before in my life. I watched a lot of golf. And he proceeded to tell me about uh, playing in South South America and Asia and the Ben Hogan tour, the Nike tour. And he had his card and he lost the card. I said, what's the card? What, what's Q school? What is all this stuff? What's sectional qualifying for the US Open? I, does Jack Nicholas have to get his card? Does he have to qualify? And he was so humble and told us this story, but I remember at the end of it, he was defiant. He looked me in the eye and he said, I, I got my card back this last fall and this time I'm never giving it back because I believe I'm good enough to play out here and I believe I'm, I'm supposed to be out here. So, you know, kind of was like, well, good luck. We'll be watching for you. And, you know, I didn't expect we'd ever see his name again, but I think he had a, a win maybe that fall. I think it was at Disney and it got him into the Masters in 94. And, you know, we turned on the Masters the next spring and he's chasing Old Thobble around Amen Corner. And, uh, you know, in the next four or five years where the Tom Lehman tour became a number one player right before Tiger took it over. And uh, when they announced Davis Love as the captain here, his, his first pick as assistant captain was Tom Lehman. And I'm like, what's going to happen here? Because uh, this is all coming around again. And um, there's some more stories that, that dwell off of that. But um, to your point, I think in golf, and I've heard so many other stories from people, there's these things, they come around in circles. You just kind of wait for them and uh, it'll happen if you're looking for them. And with that, we're going to pause and make the turn on this episode. If you've enjoyed everything so far, be sure to tune in to part two of our conversation with Chandler Withington. Until then, we wish you plenty of golf at its finest and life at its best.